Good morning. Today I'm going to attempt a tag. It's an original tag started by Brian at Bookish and it's the sex in literature tag. So here we go. Question number one. What is a book you have read that comes close to crossing the line between literature slash adult fiction and pornography? So I don't have an answer to this question. I can't think of anything. Uh, I know that there are genres of literature out there which are written to sort of uh, excite the passions, but I've never ventured into any of those waters, so uh, no answer. Next question. What is a book you have read with a cringeworthy depiction of sex? So I thought long and hard about this question, and I am happy to report that I have an answer. And wow, is this a, this is serious. Okay, Philip K. Dick is actually one of my favorite authors. I love, love Philip K. Dick. And I haven't read it in such a long time, but I have fond memories of reading The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, which is a short story by Philip K. Dick. And yeah, I think I really loved the story, but there is a description of sex in here, which is off the charts. Okay. I'm just going to read the final paragraph. And you, the viewer, might find this hard to believe, but this is actually a description of a female orgasm. Here we go. Quote, a long silence, then. Then, oof, she leaped, galvanized, as if lost to the shock of a formal experiment. His pale, dignified, unclothed possession became a tall and very thin, greenless nervous system of a frog, probed to life by outside means, victim of a current not her own, but not protested in any way, lucid and real, accepting, ready this long time. End quote. So first of all, this metaphor of like mechanical, scientific probing, electric shock, um, it's just, it's just crazy. It's just completely crazy. And, but just beyond that, putting aside how completely unsexy that metaphor is, um, like imagine describing a male orgasm with like such a far out metaphor. Um, I mean, I think, I think we turn to books and we sort of expect authors to use language in a like sensible way to describe things in like a sensible way. And I think when Philip K. Dick appeals to a metaphor like that, I mean, he is screaming. He is screaming. I am going to describe something I cannot comprehend at all. Next question. What's the most overrated book with the reputation for being sexy that you have read? I do not have an answer to this question. I don't think I've ever read any book with a reputation for being sexy, as far as I know. Four. What is your favorite passage from a book about or describing a sexual situation? So I don't have one answer to this question, but I will, I will list actually three passages. And the point of listing three passages is that they're all so completely different. So my favorite representation of sex in literature measured by the power of the language, the power of the language to convey kind of the insanity, the madness of sexual arousal. That would have to go to Vladimir Nabokov. And he describes sex scenes in a few places. Uh, the two that come to mind are two places in Lolita and one place in his book Ada or Ardor. Uh, the quote that I'm going to read as my favorite will be from Lolita very early on in the book. And it has the advantage, this particular quote, of being relatively consensual. It's between two very young children um, and not uh, overly pornographic. Although in other places, for example, the scene where Humbert Humbert molests Lolita on the couch in Lolita and uh, the scene in Ada or Ardor, which is 
a scene about incest, uh, incest is also um, much more pornographic. Uh, but this is this is really good, and just the the point being the power of his language to describe the obsession, the madness of sexual desire. This is Humbert Humbert describing a childhood tryst, his childhood sexual awakening with another girl called Annabelle, quote, all at once we were madly, clumsily, shamelessly, agonizingly in love with each other. Hopelessly, I should add, because that frenzy of mutual possession might have been assaged only by our actually imbibing and assimilating every particle of each other's soul and flesh. But there we were, unable to mate as slum children would have so easily found an opportunity to do. After one wild attempt, we made to meet at night in her garden, of which more later, the only privacy we were allowed was to be out of earshot, but not out of sight, on the populous part of the plage. There, on the soft sand, a few feet away from our elders, we would sprawl all morning in a petrified paroxysm of desire and take advantage of every blessed quirk in space and time to touch each other. Her hand, half hidden in the sand, would creep toward me, its slender brown fingers sleepwalking nearer and nearer. Then, her opalescent knee, would start on a long, cautious journey, sometimes a chance rampart built by younger children granted us sufficient concealment to graze each other's salty lips. These incomplete contacts drove our healthy and inexperienced young bodies to such a state of exasperation that not even the cold blue water under which we still clawed at each other could bring relief." End quote. And so that is quote number one. Uh, number two, my second and additional favorite quote about sex comes from Victor Hugo in Les Miserables. And when I was uh, in college, much younger than today, I loved this quote. And I, when I read this, when I read Les Mis for the first time and I came across this quote, I loved it. I absolutely love this quote. And this has the virtue of being very discreet and modest and focusing on the spiritual, more metaphysically redemptive aspect of the sexual experience. Quote, Here we pause. On the threshold of wedding nights stands a smiling angel with his finger on his lips. The soul enters into contemplation before that sanctuary where the celebration of love takes place. There should be flashes of light athwart such houses. The joy which they contain ought to make it escape through the stones of the walls in brilliancy and vaguely illuminate the gloom. It is impossible that this sacred and fatal festival should not give off a celestial radiance to the infinite. Love is the sublime crucible wherein the fusion of the man and the woman takes place. The being one, the being triple, the being final, the human trinity proceeds from it. This birth of two souls into one ought to be an emotion for the gloom. The lover is the priest, the ravished virgin is terrified. Something of that joy ascends to God. Where true marriage is, that is to say, where there is love, the ideal enters in. A nuptial bed makes a nook of dawn amid the shadows. If it were given to the eye of the flesh to scan the formidable and charming visions of the upper life, it is probable that we should behold the forms of night, the winged unknowns, the blue passers of the invisible bend down, a throng of somber heads around the luminous house, satisfied, showering benedictions, pointing out to each other, the virgin wife, gently alarmed, sweetly terrified, and bearing the reflection of human bliss upon their divine countenances. If at that supreme hour, the wedding pair, dazzled with voluptuousness and believing themselves alone, were to listen, 
they would hear in their chamber a confused rustling of wings. Perfect happiness implies a mutual understanding with the angels. That dark little chamber has all heaven for its ceiling. When two mouths, rendered sacred by love, approach to create, it is impossible that there should not be above that ineffable kiss a quivering throughout the immense mystery of stars. These felicities are the true ones. There is no joy outside these joys. Love is the only ecstasy. All the rest weeps. End quote. After I got older, after I got married, uh, I began to think of it more as a little bit like propaganda. I'm not, I'm not convinced that virginal wedding night sex is actually uh, the best, greatest joy in the world, such that all else weeps. Um, maybe for Victor Hugo it was. So we're still on this question number four. What is your favorite passage from a book about or describing sex or a sexual situation? And we've uh, mentioned two already, and now I'm going to go to mention my third final answer to this question. And the reason that the following is my favorite is because it is repressed. It is not visible, but it seems to me to really lie beneath the surface. And so for this category, I have Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Moby Dick has practically no women in the entire book. It's a book about our narrator Ishmael who goes on a whaling ship, which is only men. But in my opinion, it's shot through with this sexual energy, which is so amazing and so incredible. And for me, is part of what makes the book so compelling. It's not surprising to me that this uh, whaling voyage of all men should have this undercurrent of sexual tension, of sexuality. The book opens with our narrator Ishmael meeting this character, Quake Quake, who's like this uh, South Islander. Um, he's tattooed, he's black, and uh, he comes up in, in, in the context, and according to the book, he comes from like a, a tribe of cannibals. And they have a very frightening first experience because they're sharing a bed at an inn. And so Ishmael is like lying down in the bed and in the middle of the night, he sees Quake Quake come in and he's terrified out of his mind. And Quake Quake can't see Ishmael because uh, the lights are off. Anyway, it's very frightening for both parties involved. But they figure it out. The innkeeper comes in and says, you guys are sharing a bed, get over it, whatever. They share a bed. And, and he wakes up with Quake Quake's arm over him. And our narrator describes it as like the most sublime experience of his entire life to be spooned by Quake Quake. And he compares it to like a memory from childhood that has like haunted him of, uh, you know, some sort of waking dream or something. And in the following chapters, it describes them holding hands, walking down the street, and people are making fun of them or commenting about them behind their back, but they don't care because they're so happy. They have found friendship together. Um, and much later in the book, on the boat, is this following quote, which I think about a lot. And before I read this, just note that the word sperm in this context is referring to uh, the fluid, the spermaceti fluid in the sperm whale, which these whalers are trying to extract from the whale uh, to bring back and sell at a very high price. Um, quote, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. All the morning long, I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me. I found myself, unwittingly, squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill humor or envy. Come, let us squeeze hands all around. Nay, 
Let us squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. End quote. All right, next question. Question number five. What is a book you have recently read that you think handles descriptions, discussions of sex well? So, luckily, surprisingly, I have a good answer for this one. I recently audiobooked Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. And that book just tells the story of three women and their experiences. And it foregrounds the sexuality of these women and the role that sex and sexual desire plays in these stories. And it's such a simple concept. But what I found, as someone who's mostly read male authors their whole life, that this foregrounding of the female sexual experience was like something very unusual to me. I think there's like an understanding and expectation in human life and books and literature that men can do crazy things because of sex, self-destructive things, dangerous things, and it can become like a focus in their life. Nabokov in, in Lolita puts in the mouth of Humbert Humbert this idea that his, his sexual desires, like the singularity at the core of his existence. And what Lisa Tadeo does in this book is she says that women are human beings too, and they have human experiences too, and they can also have something just like that. They can have desire and obsessions on the same level. And in a sense, it's obvious but seeing it and reading it and foregrounding it was, for me, a very uh, unique experience. Question number six. What are some books that contain positive and frank descriptions of sexual relationships between LGD, LGBTQ plus characters? Unfortunately, I only have one answer to this because I may have only read one book uh, about LGBTQ love. And that would be Call Me By Your Name, which is a book that I, I really enjoy. But I, I can't answer this question just because my, um, my reading scope is quite small. Question number seven. What do you think is the best way of depicting sex in literature slash fiction? So, I mean, for me, it just is completely open. There's no, there's no correct way. It's like asking, you know, what's the best way to do dialogue? What's the best way uh, to describe a character? I mean, the answer is you want it to be uh, consistent with the style and the themes of the book, and you want it to be relevant to the kind of uh, emotional landscape and thematic landscape that you're trying to portray. And so there is no, obviously, answer. A another book that comes to mind when I think about this question, when I think about how to describe sex, is Paradise Lost. In Paradise Lost, I see John Milton addressing himself to these like epic questions of human history, of human existence, of good and evil, of the relationship between God and man and the metaphysical and the physical. And so unsurprisingly, he is going to address the question of human sexuality and he's going to give an opinion. He's going to give a perspective on that. If I remember correctly, there's a sex scene um, between Adam and Eve before they eat from this uh, forbidden fruit that causes them to have the fall, but it's not very memorable. On the other hand, after the fall, there's another sex scene. This is John Milton describing post-lapsarian sex. Quote, carnal desire inflaming. He on Eve began to cast lascivious eyes she him as wantonly repaid in lust they burn till adam thus gain eve to dalliance move end quote and so that is a intense description of lust in this post-lapsarian world but before the fall and this to me is even more interesting adam and eve are talking to a angel raphael and Raphael has come to warn them 
about the approach of uh, Satan. That's the context. And Adam and Eve uh, have a question for this angel. It's a question that I guess John Milton was wondering and it's a question that I guess he thought his readers might be curious about. So he puts into the mouth of Eve, excuse me, Adam. He puts into the mouth of Adam. Quote, Adam to the angel Raphael, love not the heavenly spirits and how their love express they by looks only or do they mix irradiance virtual or immediate touch, end quote. And so Adam is asking, do angels have sex? And if so, how? We continue, quote, to whom the angel with a smile that glowed celestial rosy red loves proper hue, that is to say, uh, Raphael is blushing, and he responds, quote, let it suffice thee that thou knowest us happy, and without love, no happiness. Whatever pure thou in the body enjoyest, and pure that were created, we enjoy in eminence, an obstacle find none of membrane, joint, or limb, exclusive bars, easier than air with air. If spirits embrace, total they mix, union of pure with pure, desiring, nor restrained conveyance need, as flesh to mix with flesh, or soul with soul. End quote. And so the angel describes this total, all-consuming sexual experience that these angels engage in. I want to end just by thinking a little bit more about one of my all-time favorite books, which is Lolita, which I have here. What Nabokov does is he's able to describe sex as something infinitely powerful and consuming. And in Lolita, he puts us in the mind of Humbert Humbert. And we enter Humbert Humbert's world. Entering the mind of Humbert Humbert is sort of like entering the upside down in uh, the television show Stranger Things. It's like entering a parallel universe. It's like entering a version of our world, a version of existence, which is similar, but it's dark and it's twisted. And it sort of lives as like a parallel universe, but a horrible parallel universe to our own. It sort of makes manifest the monstrous elements of society, the vampiric elements that human beings are capable of achieving. And it makes that visible. And the whole book is about describing that parallel reality where Humbert Humbert operates. A major recurring place in the book is a hotel called the Enchanted Hunters. It comes up again and again. I'm not going to go into the plot and explain why. It's not important right now. But there's a scene in the book where Humbert Humbert describes this hotel. It's the place where he first has sex with Lolita. And he describes the murals on the wall, which is, you know, some sort of rustic, I don't know, uh, woodsy kind of scene, Enchanted Hunters. And he says the following, quote, Had I been a painter, had the management of the Enchanted Hunters lost its mind one summer day and commissioned me to redecorate their dining room with murals of my own making, this is what I might have thought up. Let me list some fragments. There would have been a lake. There would have been an arbor in flame flower. There would have been nature studies. A tiger pursuing a bird of paradise. A choking snake sheathing whole the flayed trunk of a shoat. There would have been a sultan, his face expressing great agony belied, as it were, by his molding caress, helping the Califigian slave child to climb a column of onyx. There would have been those luminous globules of gonadal glow that travel up the opulescent sides of jukeboxes. 
There would have been all kinds of camp activities on the part of the intermediate group, canoeing, coranting, combing curls in the lakeside sun. There would have been poplars, apples, a suburban Sunday. There would have been a fire opal dissolving within a ripple ringed pool, a last throb, a last dab of color, stinging red, smarting pink, a sigh, a wincing child." End quote. 